session. Recording started. Thank you. <clears throat> because of the continuation of the COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting is being held electronically over the Zoom platform. It is authorized by the county's declaration of local emergency, the county's continuity of government ordinance, this authority's resolution, and Virginia Code section 2.23708.2, subsection A3. The public has real-time audiovisual access to this meeting over Zoom, real-time audio access over telephone. Everyone on the phone and attending via Zoom from the public is in listen-only mode at this point. The following instructions apply uh, to those who wish to speak during the public comment. If you are listening on Zoom, please use the raise hand feature to notify the meeting facilitator. For those joining by telephone, please use star nine to indicate you would like to comment. Tell the board your full name and the magisterial district in which you reside before getting into the substance of your comment. If you don't know your magisterial district, provide a general location for your home or business. Uh, the street location or neighborhood name will suffice. Each speaker will be allowed no more than three minutes to comment. This meeting is being recorded. A copy will be posted on the county's website. And with that explanation, I will ask the board members to identify themselves and their general location. So we'll start with uh, the chair, uh, Mr. Walsh. This is Bucky Walsh. I'm at my home in uh, Albemarle County near Earliesville. Uh, Waldo Jaquith. Waldo Jaquith here at my home in Stony Point. Trevor Henry. Trevor Henry, virtually present at my residence in Elmore County. Let's see, uh, William Fritz. I'm here at my home in Charlottesville. Supervisor Price. I'm present from my home in Scottsville. And Supervisor Andrews. I am here at my home in the beautiful Samuel Miller District, just south of Charlottesville. All right, Mr. Chair, we uh, have everyone present and a quorum. Well, thanks, Richie. Then I'll uh, call this meeting to order. And our uh, first uh, item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Hopefully everyone has received a copy of it. Are there any suggestions for changes or is this acceptable as presented? Is there a motion to accept this agenda? So moved. I'll second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, we'll take this as the agenda. Uh, that brings us on to brief announcements by the authority members. If anyone has an announcement, uh, just wave your hand and speak for it. Well, I, I have one then. I have actually two. Uh, the first is a uh, happy new year to uh, all the members of the authority. It uh, it's, seems like it's been a year since I saw you. And the second is to welcome our new member. Uh, welcome, Jim Andrews. Uh, delighted to have you on the team. Uh, normally, if we were meeting in person, you'd be bringing donuts, of course, because you're the new guy and, until there's another new guy, but you're off the hook right now. Uh, and would you like to say anything? Uh, thank you. I, I am uh, I'm very uh, happy to be on this body uh, authority. I, I know that this work is very important. I've had even more calls today relating to matters uh, connected to this and, uh, and obviously emails. So I'm uh, happy to be here and uh, thank you. We're delighted to have you on board. Anyone else? Then we'll keep moving right along. It brings us to the public comment uh, part of our meeting. Uh, and it looks like one of our attendees already has their hand in the air. Uh, if we could bring Steve Brewer online, that'd be great. Yes, sir. Mr. Brewer, you should be unmuted or unmute yourself. There you go. Good, uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Steve Brewer, uh, representing Lumen. Um, I did not uh, intend to uh, officially uh, announce that I was ready to, to make a comment, but uh, certainly here and, um, and interested in the, the committee's work. Well, thanks very much for attending. We're delighted to have you. Now we know who to call when we have Lumen questions. 
Is there anyone else from the public who'd like to speak? Give you guys a few seconds to figure out the star nine or any other method of raising your hand. Um, it looks like Donna Price would like to speak. Thank you, Chair, and uh, not from the public, but um, Mr. Brewer, since you are here, um, when we were very appreciative of um, Lumen providing some representatives at the January 12th Board of Supervisors meeting, and we did send some questions back with um, Lumen, I was just wondering if you had an update on when we might anticipate receiving responses. So we have been actively working on the question or responses to your questions. Um, actually, we have an internal meeting tomorrow to discuss that matter. I don't have a specific date uh, just yet. Um, Mike Culp and I discussed that earlier today, and I will I'll be happy to communicate back to him um, when I have something more concrete for you. But rest assured, we are working in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Brewer. I appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments from the public? And seeing none, I think we should move on. Uh, that brings us to the uh, December 22nd uh, meeting minutes. Uh, Bill, tell us about the minutes. Uh, the minutes are still a work in progress, so you don't have them yet. I will, I will get them to you shortly. Very good. Then we'll look for those at our next meeting. Thank you. And moving right along, we're at uh, old business, the uh, uh, body. I'm sorry. Uh, just one thing. Uh, I don't know. Mike, have you uploaded the, um, the, the video from that meeting yet? Yes. Just, just to let people know that even though the minutes aren't ready, the, the, the video is often uploaded before the minutes are ready. So if people are interested in what happened at the last meeting, uh, go to our website and they can actually view the meeting. Great point. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for that. Uh, Mike, you want to uh, take us with the Vadi 2021 update? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, CenturyLink Lumen folks who are on can answer questions, but I'm going to briefly go through 21. Um, essentially, what's happened with 21 is we continue to have community-based webinars where we ask the community to contribute to improvement efforts as well as get updated on what's going on with the project. As far as where we are, there's two scheduled um, announcements that'll be coming with both Jones Mill Road and Old Garth Heights. Now CenturyLink, Lumen and Quantum Fiber are working toward what are called the ability for customers to place install orders. And right now we're targeted to have that end of January, early February. So. Mike, everything. To, to clarify for everybody on the call, how many com companies is CenturyLink, Lumen, and Quantum Fiber? Realistically, it's all held by a single company. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, essentially, you know, we ran into problems on Jones Mill Road where there were three instances of rock that was un unanticipated, and lots of questions went back and forth on how do we avoid future delays and why wasn't the rock identified during pre-planning and will there be any environmental impacts on working around the rock? Um, and do we have to go back to VDOT to get more permits? And the answers to all those questions are no. So things are working along. It's just expensive to bring the boring equipment in to um, go through the rock so that the rest of the fiber run can make its way through Jones Mill Road. So a slight delay, um, the rest of the projects are still on their original schedule. So we continue to monitor that and look forward to connecting more people on fiber here in the uh, 2022. So that's it for the 21 project, unless there's questions from the ABBA board. And if I can't answer it, we've got people from CenturyLink who can. So questions, comments, Jason, you wanna, update any updates that you have on the webinars and what's next maybe the uh subgroup that we're developing maybe of interest to the broad Mike? party yes sir sorry um may not be uh, in order here I'm raising my hand it's not a question but i think it might be worth sharing 
that uh, you have brought on with to, uh, within the, the broadband office, uh, a temporary employee part-time that is basically acting as owner's rep yes, and is, is gonna be visiting um, the, the installations on site and will be kind of eyes, eyes on the county um, at the various sites. It's, a, it's something that when, when we envisioned the broadband office, this was something we programmed into the 23 budget it's taken us a little while to kind of get this position um, landed, but uh, I think it's a great um, addition to the to the broadband office team, and and will be uh, able to provide some direct uh, reporting and assessment of the work that's underway. So maybe I just gave the update, Mike. Sorry, um, <laughs> but, I, but I thought it was worth the, the authority of knowing that. Yes, and his his name is Tommy Garland, so he's a longtime resident of Albemarle County, and. Um, a welcome addition who will be doing inspections on the ground and will be meeting with the uh, CenturyLink Lumen um, folks as well as the subcontractors who are working. So we're really excited about the addition of a, another person to help us with the project. So thanks, thanks for that, Mr. Henry. So I just want to add that is delightful news. <laughs> I was just <laughs> looking uh, last night at the progress of work happening and looking on a map thinking like, okay, where can I drive? How can I see that this work's being done? This is actually happening. I figured maybe once a month I can visit a different site because we need to be able to have some sort of oversight here. And I just really love that y'all have done the work to set this up in funding and then actually execute it and then uh, hire Mr. Garland to actually do the work. Um, I feel so much better knowing that, yes, we're getting updates from the vendor, and that's great, but that we're also verifying that work's being done and so that we at the county can understand it's actually being done as described. Just bravo. I'm, I'm really glad you've done this. Um, and I will add to, to help um, in, in scratching that itch for you, uh, Mr. Jake, with um, we are setting up um, a reporting system. So there's going to be a field report that's going to be done using ArcGIS uh, that will allow you to actually visualize um, both where the work is being happening, how are the reports coming in, and then actually look at submitted pictures from uh, Mr. Garland so that you can see the actual work happening and it'll, it'll, it'll save you the trip out to, um, to, to, to Old Garth and, and Jones Mill. I can see it. Is there any way that we can also make it possible for members of the public to look at the website and see the progress of this work? Um, I, I'm pushing I, my luck, I know. <laughs> I was going to say, um, I think that what we can start to do when the time is appropriate um, is to integrate it into our monthly webinars um, so that people can see um, some of that proof of work and some of the, uh, the demonstrations. Um, I would hesitate because right now that this is living on the other side of, of, of our ArcGIS threshold. Uh, I would hesitate to say like, yes, we're going to make this all publicly reporting. Um, but um, right now, consider it a uh, 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 work in progress of the county executive's office. I think that's the language that Richie likes. Um, and then um, when we report it out uh, to through the webinars, it will obviously be publicly available. Thank you. I have no doubt that for uh, those members of the public who see someone running fiber down <laughs> their street, knowing because they could verify it with a picture from our website that that's going to be their fiber one day would be very exciting for them yeah. as opposed to just something else happening. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add, um, don't want to overpromise what can actually be, be, be published in a, in a real time, uh, but for certain, um, as, as part of uh, the, the office's monthly report to, to broad the authority, we can include that as part of the, the, the report out. And so I would imagine as part of this meeting, it would be nice to see some visuals um, to represent progress. And this, is, this work is in line with the other work that we do on, on many of our capital projects where we have project managers and project inspectors that are out and, and doing this kind of work. Um, so that, that's really the model that we're following. But uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad that uh, the authority um, is excited about this. I know I am. It's, it's great to have some eyes uh, out on the county for this kind of work. Thanks for bringing it up, Trevor. Mike, does that wrap up 2021? It does, sir. Thank you. Well, let's go to 2022. Okay, that's me again. Thank you, Chair. 22 is our project with the TJPDC and Firefly. It's the big project with 5,000 passings at least, at minimum 5,000 passings. No update thus far. The TJPDC and Firefly 
um, are continuing to work on the schedule. Um, there will be some documentation that the broadband authority will have to review and sign, but we're working to provide that hopefully within the next month. Uh, so for the public, the best update that we can give refers back to Mr. Fritz's comment, the recording of the December 15th meeting of the broadband authority. I think it was December 15th, December 22nd, December 22nd. Um, that is a, a really great update from Gary Wood about the progress and how they're moving forward with the, the project. So I would encourage the public for updates on Body 22 to go visit the website for Albemarle County and look through the agendas and our um, ABBA meeting from December 22nd, there will be a link to the recording. And it's early on in the, pro in the, in the meeting. So it's, a, it's up front and a great, great thing to view. Questions, concerns? Do you wanna talk at all about the uh, RISE kickoff meeting? Sure, thank you, Chair. It's a great, great opportunity for the Chair to comment on the, <laughs> what's called a, uh, with every year with BODY, there is what's called a contract negotiation record meeting, which is a, a walkthrough of a document where all of the BODY applicants and the partners go through and have tasks assigned to them. And Chair Walsh was able to attend the uh, CNR, the contract negotiation record reading um, with DHCD and TJPDC and Firefly. So I'll turn it over to Chair Walsh for his update. Thank you for reminding me. We've, uh, we've done this before, obviously, but in a very different role. This meeting had about 30 people on the call, both from DHCD on the state side, as well as uh, Firefly folks, a couple of folks from the TJPDC. But then it had representatives from most of the 13 counties that were involved. Um, not, not quite all of them, but most of them, sometimes more than one. So there was a whole bunch of people on the call and most of us had nothing to do because this meeting's really between TJBDC, the, uh, the Firefly folks and DHCD. And at the end of the day, the vast majority of the meeting was uh, uh, Gary Wood going through some questions he had about the materials that had gone back and forth between them and, and both asking and answering questions and getting answers to questions about things that would matter in the, uh, in the final contracting that they're gonna do. Um, and the time was well used, but it was really about details that had to go in the contract. Contracts this year are a little more complicated than they had been in the past uh, due to the presence of federal monies and the requirements for those. Uh, one little highlight from that was uh, the federal money requires that there be a, uh, a dashboard that's uh, publicly available. Uh, and so the Firefly guys are going to be putting up a dashboard to meet this federal requirement uh, sometime early on in the process. Be interesting to see what that is and, and how it can be used. Uh, there's a, a fairly well-defined uh, project management uh, process that's going to be used with uh, measures that will be applied to various deliverables in the in the program, and and I'm hoping all of those will turn up on the dashboard. Many of them will be irrelevant to us. I mean, I, it's interesting what they're doing in Louisa County, but not, you know, doesn't inform me much about Albemarle. Um, uh, we're still a big part of the project, um, and it it just it's so exciting. Um, for those of you who haven't been tuned into this project beforehand, our expectation is nothing short of everyone in the county who does not currently have 25.3 internet speeds available to them will have that or much, much better by the end of this project. And that's in a three year period of time. What's gonna happen in that same period of time is that we'll have determined that 25.3 isn't fast enough anymore. So there'll be some people who we've got to go back to and use future federal monies that are coming to catch them up to the, uh, the fiber type connect connectivity that we're gonna have. But this project is really gonna move us much, much, much closer to the goalposts uh, as far as the broadband authority is concerned. Um, so it's exciting. It will take some time to get underway just because there are contracts that have to be between various parties, us with, Gosh, TJPDC and possibly us with Firefly and TJPDC with Firefly and TJPDC with DHCD and all the other counties all the same way. So 
um, you know, folks wearing Richie's hat will have much, much work to do in the next four or five months um, as we get all that ironed out. But uh, it got off to a good start. Everyone was very positive. The, uh, uh, the atmosphere was exciting. Hopefully by the time we get to the end of the project, it'll be just as exciting. Uh, and I see there are a couple of questions, uh, Bill. Uh, when's the contract supposed to be signed? What's the deadline for that? I'm not sure there's a deadline per se. Uh, there's a target of getting it done within the next three months or so. I would expect that by May was probably more realistic, but I could be wrong. Uh, and Mr. Andrews. Uh, yeah, just a quick clarification. You mentioned the 5,000 passings and then the uh, different standards for 25.3 versus much higher expectations for most uh, fiber. Uh, I assume that is all of this project fiber, so it's all of this project fiber to the faster. home and the yeah. fiber service that's going to be offered. They have two service levels right now. One is symmetric gigabit, and the other is symmetric 100 megabit. Um, the 100 megabit, if I remember correctly, is 49 bucks a month, or 49.99 a month, and the gigabit's 79.99 a month, or something like that. Um, and our expectation is uh, that. Future, future federal monies will require connectivity of at least 100 megabits symmetric, um, which will make some of our current installations where people have 25.3, which is the old standard, they're not gonna be broadband anymore. And, and certainly if you've got a couple of kids at home and, and mom and dad are trying to work from home as well, you could see why you need 100 megabit. It's not just about playing Call of Duty with your friends really, really quickly. It's, it's living in many cases, so. Uh, we'll have more work to do even as this project proceeds along. Any other questions? Thank you. Then back to you, Mike. Thank you. Any any other questions about the 22 update? Not. I think we're on to the financial report. So, Mr. Henry, as treasurer, you want to take us through the appendix? Thanks, Mike. Uh, members of the board, uh, if you uh, can reference the agenda document, the financial update is at the bottom uh, part of that. Um, basically reflects previous work that has been done uh, through uh, the, the 2020 um, project and, and that that is fully paid out. And that we have the commitments, um, obligation slash commitments for the current project underway and then and then the, the obligation for the 2022 project. Um, still working with Mike and team to understand how we'll be processing payment on the, the, the 2022 project since it's a different model than we've done in the past. And we'll, uh, we'll be sorting that out, whether it's um, direct to TJPDC and they're dispersing it or if it'll be done um, you know, in increments. Uh, more, more to follow, I think, as we get that contract resolved, that'll help define those terms. But bottom line, this shows summary of funds. Uh, and I think there, as I look at it, there may be a uh, typo in the $88 million total at the fund balance. I don't think that is actually, I'm sorry, $88,000. That actually <laughs> reflects, sorry, trying to look between screens here at my house. Um, that reflects what is current um, un unobligated funding that still resides in the broadband authority. So uh, not much to report beyond that. Questions? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Trevor. Um, Mike, um, you want to take us through the uh, broadband accessibility and affordability Chair, report? Chair Walsh, I, oh, I guess sorry, I should Trevor. ask, uh, assuming I, I am still the treasurer or is that... Uh, <laughs> did we uh you were elected to be the treasurer in august uh, okay the, so that was an august to, uh any uh, previous what? votes to impeach you have all failed so <laughs> okay. you're still in that job I, I will continue to do the reports then thank you <laughs> thank you uh mike the uh affordability accessibility and affordability report yes otherwise known as bow yeah the the baao the broadband office We've been doing a lot of work on the affordability side. We continue to work with the Department of Social Services, uh, determining the best way to do what is called our affordability connectivity program bridge and to bring the ABBA board up to speed on what ACP bridge stands for is the 
federal government had put forward a stipend uh, called the Emergency Broadband Benefit. And that benefit provided up to $50 per month stipend for folks who qualified uh, for assistance paying their broadband bills. Um, when the ACP comes into play, that benefit drops to $30. So some households, especially those who have qualified and are receiving two benefits because they have a benefit for their local internet, and then they also have a benefit for their wireless service internet, all of a sudden they um, are faced with a $40 a month or even a $20 a month additional burden. So what we're trying to do in Albemarle County is help offset that. Um, so we get back up to the normal, uh, what was once $50 and, and provide services for our lower income, more vulnerable population. So that's the first thing that I have to update. Anything else you wanna talk about? All your um, effort going out into the community, Jason, just an update on activity that's happened. It'd be important, um, more questions now. A question, how many participants do you currently have? Not Since yet. We don't have the uh, we don't have the program the program in place yet. We're still working on the details to get it in place. So, so even at the fifty dollar level, you don't have any participants. Oh, we we know the EBB, and I'll let Jason take over. Okay. On that one. Thank you, Jim. Um, thank you. The the EBB, um, and I, I've mentioned this in the past. Um, it does not have a particularly great reporting uh, 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 process. It reports out on a zip code level. Um, so using um, a little bit of GIS, we can make an estimate of how many uh, how many users or enrollees are in the county. Um, that has been at 800 as of, I believe, October. Um, so we're expecting some new numbers shortly. Um, once those new numbers come in, we can update. We are working with DSS to try to boost those numbers. Um, our best estimate is that there are 8,000 eligible households in Albemarle County. Um, and that is based on the eligibility criteria is almost any DSS benefit plus free and reduced school lunch plus uh, Pell Grants and uh, certain veterans programs. And so it is a broad net. Um, so we are estimating 8,000. We're only at 800 um, as of October. Um, we're working with DSS in a couple of ways to try to boost that number. And we're looking at a, a renewed um, but targeted effort um, on both in increasing ACP, um, enrolling in ACP Bridge when that time comes. Um, and then the other thing, and uh, Chair, you alluded a little bit to this, um, that's new for us. Um, there are... Um, there was a rule change, a couple of, of, of rule changes um, at the treasury level. This is soup that uh, Mr. Jake would swims in a lot more comfortably than me, but um, the outcome of these rule changes is that at least on a uh, funded by the treasury level and likely as a signal towards a broader adoption, um, there's a move towards 100-100 as the um, new standard for broadband. Um, and what that does for our office and for the authority is it no longer sort of shackles us to just looking in the rural area for areas that need both um, accessibility and uh, affordability, well, at, for areas that need accessibility changes. Um, it allows us to now look a little bit more inward at the development area where there are an awful lot of Comcast customers that likely get less than 100 hundred. Um, there may even be, you know, some uh, private networks that are being managed and run in apartment complexes um, through other providers, through through local providers um, that are at under 100 hundred. And so, looking at ways that we can now target um, both the rural areas that are not currently part of uh, Rise, um, but also at the development areas where. Um, 100, 100 is not being achieved. Um, and so to, to make sure that we're targeting things um, in an effective way, um, we're gonna start doing an analysis, um, an equity analysis of broadband speeds and um, the demographics of the county um, to give us an idea of where are the areas where we can have the greatest impact with um, efforts to advance accessibility um, in the development area and rural area together. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. We're still early on that. Um, and then also answer any questions that you guys might have on ACP and ACP Bridge. Seeing none. Okay. I think you covered it. Well, that's it for the broadband office report. Other than to say we're continuing to take 
uh, escalation requests from citizens and uh, forwarding them over, over to CenturyLink and Lumen. So those, those continue and there's been great effort to restore services to most of the county. There's still some areas that still haven't been restored. So we're working to make sure CenturyLink provides attention to those details. And that's it for the broadband office. Thanks, Mike. Uh, that takes us into new business. Um, the first item here is a recap of the uh, January 12th work session with the Board of Supervisors and discuss our next steps. Hopefully our recap won't cover all of it because it was a long work session. Um, who's got the lead on this, Mike? Is that you? It's me for the moment, Chair. I want to thank Jason for all the work that he's done to, to get us to this point. And he's got a few slides he'd like to run through with the board, and then we'll have plenty of time with discussion. So. We've got a letter in front of you. I think everyone has seen that letter and um, hopefully it's in a draft mode that will have some additional changes to it or it could be approved for submittal. Uh, lots of options, but um, we're anxious to hear and, and work with the broadband authority to move forward. So Jason, you wanna run through the slides? Yeah, so um, just reviewing a few slides and a couple of updates from the work session. I hope that uh, many of you were able to attend. Um, so one of the things that we um, that that our office did in the lead up um, is to again track certain emails um, that that were sent to us directly, sent to us by um, supervisors um, to see um, how we can help our residents. Um, during the course of the past year, handle some outage and new installation um, and reliability issues. Um, so in total, there were 200 emails tracked um, and they referenced 117 different locations. Um, additionally, uh, the Board of Supervisors put out a call for comment by email um, on Monday before the work session on Wednesday. Um, by Wednesday, we had over 100 uh, comments emailed to us. There were several uh, public commenters during the meeting, um, and then a number of additional emails trickled in. Um, the breakdown shows new installations as the greatest concern. Um, now, looking at that data, um, that is all Vadi 2020. Um, we, uh, in collaboration with Lumen, feel confident that a lot of the challenges that we experienced related um, to these new installations um, that, that hopefully we're going to be able to, to just hit it better and we're going to be able to do a better job and avoid this intensity of, of uh, complaints that are brought up regarding new installations. So if we just take out the new installation complaints that are purely about the new uh, customer initiation, um, this is what the data looks like after that. Um, with outages as the uh, clear majority of uh, complaints, um, reliability issues right behind. And then I left a new installation in there because for some of the new in new installations, there were additional uh, outage and reliability concerns even after a new installation. Um, and that is kind of how we got to this work session is to figure out um, where the challenges were and to give uh, the Board of Supervisors an opportunity to uh, speak on these challenges to uh, Lumen representatives and offer them an opportunity to respond. Um, as an update, um, we also did some analysis on those additional hundred or so emails that we received from, uh, from, from residents after the call for comment. Um, and there, once again, you see reliability and outages now combined as the uh, majority of, of the, the types, the categories of emails. Um, and then in addition to that, customer service issues. So people experiencing um, just a poor level of customer service um, during an outage or a reliability issue followed. Um, we additionally had 20%, roughly 20% of uh, emails related to speeds promised. So people paying for a certain level of, uh, of service and receiving something reliably below that. Um, 14% expressed a 911 concern, um, and then a few also expressed uh, uh, issues with credits that they believed they were owed. Um, the outages and reliability issues to us tie into a public safety concern. And this is again, uh, a slide from our, from our work session, um, because if people cannot access 911, um, then that can become, especially an emergency, um, especially a weather emergency, a public health issue, uh, a public safety issue, I apologize. Um, so, um, we identified um, two issues common throughout all of these contacts. Uh, the first was the insufficient investment in maintaining copper infrastructure. 
Uh, and the second was fissures in customer service processes that leave residents uh, seeking service kind of adrift. Um, we wanted to emphasize that CenturyLink Lumen staff has endeavored to resolve escalations as they arise. Um, we can send them uh, escalations and there are often outcomes, resolutions, um, and also that again, through Vadi 2021, we see a willingness to work with us to try to improve processes and make, uh, make progress in, in uh, lowering the number of these escalations that are necessary. There is the issue of the transfer. Um, so um, Lumen is selling all of its ILEC assets across 20 states, including all uh, uh, the majority of the ILEC areas in Albemarle County to a new entity, Connect Holdings. Um, we spent a lot of time just uh, reading the documents related to this uh, transfer and considering what our options were. Um, and one option that is before us is to submit a public comment um, as an entity, as an office, as a county um, to the uh, State Corporation Commission um, to inform their decision-making. Um, a couple of things that we can expect. Um, first is that Lumen has publicly stated that it would not be investing further in these assets. Uh, and when we're talking about the ILEC assets, this is the incumbent local exchange carrier assets. So these are the copper lines that we've been talking about that feed DSL and um, telephony in the rural area. Um, they are also selling their residential fiber um, services along with them. So that is also going, um, but in their submittals, Lumen has stated that they're not planning on investing in these assets. And so that's a little troubling from the perspective of uh, partnering with Lumen. Connect Holdings has committed to a uh, $3 billion investment um, overall, not necessarily in Virginia or in our, certainly in our area. The questions that remain, however, are related to a willingness to invest in the copper plant um, to remedy whatever issues and degradation exists to cause um, us to have so many reliability issues and outages. Um, there's also a question before us about de facto retirement. And this is when um, companies decide to not invest in maintaining copper infrastructure and allow it to degrade to the point that it is no longer functional. Um, or the possibility that they might have a planned retirement of this infrastructure um, with the possibility of a fixed wireless replacement, which isn't necessarily gonna perform well in our topography. Um, so we have asked in the past for some assurances, some updates, um, and Lumen staff in general has been has declined to answer about what's gonna happen after the sale, except to emphasize that $3 billion commitment. Our submittal to the SCC um, as written um, serves to do a few things. First, it states the present challenges um, that residents face with ILEC service um, and concerns regarding this transfer. It asks for two things. First, it asks for specific assurances regarding investment in copper plant to improve present level of service. So this is to actually get um, our telephones to work reliably um, and to not have long and extended outages, um, especially in the, in, in the interest of public safety. The second is to ask for specific assurances that copper plant would not be de facto retired or abandoned. Um, and that nor would it be formally retired without sufficient replacement. And that language comes from an old FCC rule that has since been rescinded, and it's the functional test. Um, so anything that you could have done with a telephone line prior to, say, 2015, we want to make sure that people are still able to do now. Um, and one of the reasons for, for bringing that test is um, that we don't necessarily know whose security systems still use um, copper lines, whose um, point of sale systems still use copper lines, um, medical and health uh, related reasons to require a copper line. And so a replacement has to actually fulfill all of those functions um, in order to be suitable, uh, in order to be a suitable replacement. Um, and the, the wrap up is that the, if, if these promises are kept, um, it would secure 911 access for our residents that lack fiber or wireless service in their homes for at last at least a few years. Um, at the point where there is general availability at every possible residence for fiber service um, and nobody else is asking for copper service to be maintained, um, then 
um, that would be a suitable time for uh, Lumen to decide to retire their service. Um, and that is where I will send it back to Mike and we can discuss the letter that hopefully everybody has received a copy. Thanks, Jason. Great job with that. It's the uh, importance of working with the SEC and making this a successful transition, but we have to be aware of the public safety issues that could be ignored or I, I shouldn't put it that way, could be overlooked. So it, I think it's you know the broadband authority's role to present something or nothing to the SEC as part of this transition. Um, because we are aware of the continued issues when there are storms in Albemarle County, there's delays in restoring telephony services. And if people can't dial 911, then we do have a public safety issue. And, and to be clear, the storm that happened at the beginning of January affected every wire-based carrier in this part of the state. So there's nothing, there's nothing special about CenturyLink service going down that distinguishes them from Dominion or CVEC or Rappahannock or Appalachian or Comcast. Everybody lost poles in this storm. The, the concern is speed to restore. And in many cases, you can't restore the copper service until your DSLAM gets power again. So until power comes to that and then delay after that as well. Um, so I, I, there, there is no hope that you would protect against all outages in the county that any provider would because that's not realistic. Um, the, the concern is to make sure people are not without 911 and other telephony services any longer than they have to be. Uh, or, you know, our, our more direct concern is that, that their internet works for them as soon as it possibly can. Uh, I had a question about this letter. Uh, the, the opening paragraph uh, says, in coordination and consensus with the Albemarle County Board of Supervisors, which feels to me like something they might have had to have taken a vote on for uh, us to include in our letter. And I'm uh, reluctant to have that language there if, if that's not the case. Um, Chair, may I comment on that? Please. Um, thank you. And that um, specific um, action has not been taken by the Board of Supervisors. Um, I would like to um, have the opportunity to present this draft um, to the board to come onto our agenda for next Wednesday, February the 2nd. Um, I, while I am optimistic that the board would be in concurrence, I'm not in a position to speak on behalf of the board. That would be a decision that the board has to make. And from a timing standpoint, Jason, what's the deadline for submittal of this? February 17th is the deadline for submittal for public comment. And I just wanted to say as the author for uh, that sentence, um, I, I, I did spend a lot of time uh, mulling over it. Um, I wanted to express that the, the Board of Supervisors was um, certainly um, a driving force in a lot of this work. Um, and where I landed on the term consensus um, was a general agreement to do something. Um, that was brought on specifically via email from four different boards of supervisors. Um, however, um, in the event that the that the board does, decides not to take action, I'm happy to uh, edit or modify the document as we need to. Any other comments uh, on this uh, letter? Because I think we've moved on to 7AI, the proposal for a letter to the SCC to voice our concern. Uh, um, Chair, before we move on, I was interested for other authority members that either uh, watch the work session live or, or, or the recording uh, to see if there's any discussion points that, 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 that we wanted to have before we move on to, to this next item. I, I, I participated in it, so I experienced it. I, I don't need to comment on it other than um, if, if um, I'm not looking who's on the call currently, but the... Uh, um, CenturyLink folks that, that attended appreciated their willingness to, to, to be in and part of that meeting. And I'm uh, appreciative of Steve's uh, update on working in earnest to get a response back from the board. I know the board has been reaching out to, uh, to me and to others 
uh, looking for a status on, on that response. And so I am definitely uh, hopeful that that would be on the sooner side uh, than later, as far as uh, the main themes of, the, of the, the, the concerns that were raised. But I just wanted to check to make sure there weren't additional um, questions on the work session itself. Uh, really a shout out to Mike and Jason for, uh, for managing through that uh, and working with CenturyLink in advance. Um, that was pretty remarkable that, that that was able to occur. So appreciative of that effort. I just want to add on that before we get to the letter that uh, I, I have been continuing to receive comments from the public uh, uh, relating to their services and uh, passing a lot of these on to, to Mike. To, and I uh, really appreciate the, the uh, efforts uh, by his office uh, to escalate those that are appropriate for escalation, although I do find it extremely awkward to think that uh, this office has now become the sort of uh, conduit for getting action uh, on significant issues that, that still are ongoing. Uh, we could say they're from the storm, but <laughs> as Mr. Walsh mentioned, it comes a point where uh, we expect that things will get restored and uh, they haven't all been. So um, I just wanted to make that comment. And, and I do have some comments on the draft, but I don't know if it's uh, appropriate yet to raise any questions on that. Anyone else wanna to speak to uh, Trevor's topic of the uh, the meeting? And if not, then we'll move on to the letter. Please go ahead with the letter. Well, uh, my my question on the letter is: uh, there's a, a statement in there that acknowledges, uh, as you showed in the presentation, uh, Lumen's uh, public uh, statement that they were not intending to make any further investments in their infrastructure prior to the sale. Um, I guess I, I feel a little bit like why are we do we do we have to accept that uh, as a reality what does it mean with respect to maintenance uh, of the copper infrastructure um, and I'm really worried about the timing between approval and the eventual closing of the sale that 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 things would just stop and so I, I kind of looked at that language and felt like is, is it possible to express our concerns that that there may need to be continued investments uh, to maintain this infrastructure uh, prior to the sale, regardless of what we expect Connect Holdings to do. Uh, so that's my concern. I think that's a that's a very valid point, and you never know if someone means uh, you know either. Uh, further investments are well nothing new, but we're going to maintain it. I mean, it would be nice for this to be clarified. So there was no question that what was existing would be maintained. Yes. And, and maybe if we could strengthen our wording on that a little bit, Jason, so it was absolutely clear what our uh, expectation was. Absolutely. I will say it is, um, we tried, to, tried to, 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 to walk a very narrow line on the content of the letter um, to ensure that we were always addressing the question of the sale, um, and and to put a point that that I that I forgot to mention, you know, we are not writing to oppose the sale. Um, we're not writing no. to endorse the sale um, or to to enthusiastically uh, proclaim the sale. We are simply writing to address our concerns, and that's why I we wanted to. I, I think that there's a there's space to include language that points out that we would have additional concerns about the ability to uh, and the willingness to maintain um, this infrastructure between now and uh, the closing of the sale. Um, what we did in this draft of the letter was very much to just always address the question of the sale um, and the impact after the sale. But we can include that language, certainly. Thank you. Any other comments on the letter? So it sounds to me like we should spiff this up a little bit and uh, make sure we've got a copy in front of the Board of Supervisors for their review at their meeting. And uh, if it passes muster, um, then move forward from there. Does that sound like the way we're trying to go here? Yeah, Chair Walsh? Yes. Um, thank you. And, and I think there's two options. Um, one would be that the Board 
could simply determine to endorse the final letter from the broadband authority. And the other would be that the board could both do that and or um, provide its own letter. Um, but if it's possible to get a revised draft um, to me fairly quickly, then I can um, try and get that, as I mentioned before the board on uh, our meeting on the second. Thank and you. Our, you know, our purpose would be served if the board chose to send this letter and just have the broadband authority endorsing what it's doing. I mean, we, there's no personality here. It's to get the information in front of the SCC that is the important task. Right. Um, I'm ha happy to circulate a uh, new draft this evening. Um, and uh, anybody that has additional comments that wants to send me notes offline, please feel free to do so. Does that sound acceptable to everybody? Okay. In terms just, of... Just, just noting that those responses need to be individual, not uh, reply all for... Uh, for Jason, is that Richie? Is that maybe what you were about to say? No, I, I was. Um, I was going to get to the uh, try to reach the point of when uh, Chair Walsh would be able to sign. And so, um, I, I'm just asking if there's going to be a motion that's going to allow um, uh, 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 Mike, Jason, and and then uh, Bucky to work together to formulate a final letter. And then, does the authority authorize um, Chair Walsh to sign on behalf of the of the broadband authority? Because uh, right now, I think that's missing. That's a, yeah. And, and that, of course, is uh, with the current language, which speaks to the, with the Board of Supervisors uh, supports, it would require the Board of Supervisors to take an action to support that. And with that as a contingency, if they don't, then we must remove that language from the, the final letter. Um, I, but I would ask that the, uh, and propose that the uh, uh, broadband authority let Mike, Jason, and I work on this and dependent upon where the Board of Supervisors go, uh, issue one or the other letter to the SCC or none at all if the Board of Supervisors chooses to send it on their own. Um, and, and let me sign that on behalf of, uh, for, the, for the Broadband Authority. Good luck writing that down, Bill, for the minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, well, I was gonna suggest I could make a motion to say that uh, we authorize you to sign a letter in coordination with the Board of Supervisors. Which means you could either be a separate letter or a joint letter, or none, yeah. or, or none. If the board's or sending none. one, I, I, there's no need for us to right. pile on. So. Right, right. Okay, that, that sounds good to me. I'll, I'll second that. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. Excellent. Uh, before I, I walk away from the work session, was there anything else to be talked about in that regard or can we move on? Okay, good. That was a really good session. And I, I think, uh, I'm hopeful that a lot of good outcomes will, will come from that. The last item we've got here is to set ABBA meetings for 2022. Uh, historically, we have been meeting on the fourth Wednesday uh, of the month at five o'clock. Uh, we've had some roster changes and uh, we would uh, typically set this uh, agenda through our annual meeting in August uh, when we'd look at it again and, and set the agenda for the rest of the year. Is there any conflict with the fourth Wednesday of the month at uh, 5 p.m.? Yes, Mike. Or Mr. Henry, you can take it or I, I'll take it. We, we have we, budget we, meetings. We tend to, well, uh, there's budget meeting conflicts on occasion. And then we also end up uh, the week of the holidays of Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I, I I'm, just... I'm, all, I'm only looking for an agenda through August, a set of meetings through August. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Bucky, I missed that. At, at this time, because we'll have an annual meeting at that time, we'll elect new officers, and that seems like the right time to set the you know, set of meetings for the next year after that. And we should stare closely at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yeah, at that right. time. <laughs> when, when we get when we get to August, exactly. Yeah, yeah but up upcoming the spring, the February, the March, and the April, when fourth Wednesdays are chock full of budget meetings this year. Um, the way that the budget calendar came out, the Wednesday evenings or directly before Wednesday evening. 
uh, the Board of Supervisors will be in other meetings prior to and in some cases during our regularly scheduled meetings. So I've had a request to work with the Broadband Authority and pick other evenings for February, March, and April. Okay. So we might want to look at another um, recurring, whether it's a Tuesday or a Thursday, but I don't have- How does Thursday look? Particularly for February, March, and April? Just yes. shift it to Thursday for those three months, Trevor? I serve on the Regional Transit Partnership, which is the fourth Thursday of every month. I am not on, on the partnership as a board, but I'm the executive staff support. Mm -hmm. So that would put me in a little bit of conflict. Um, is, I guess I could beg off of those meetings and get an alternate, or if we could look at maybe the Tuesday. How does Tuesday suit folks? Poker night for anybody, uh, you know? <laughs> I don't go anywhere or do anything at this point. So yeah, <laughs> leave me out, yeah. I'll be there. Tuesdays are planning commission nights. Right now, I don't have any conflicts, but that could potentially change. Um, so right now it's fine, but it could change. Uh, Chair Walsh, on a just related topic, it's related to the calendar, but just for expectation um, planning, we, we had a work session with the board uh, on, um, I think it was the 19th, around reconstitution and coming back into in-person slash hybrid meetings. Uh, walk through um, what you know staff has been thinking, got some good feedback from the board. And this is something I could more formally present maybe at our next meeting, but um, the, the legislative bodies, the Board of Supervisors, Planning Commission, School Board, they're gonna, when they do return, they'll be back in full you know, in-person mode, but also hybrid, kind of the highest level of production that we do. For, for, for that type of meeting. The broadband authority is, is a second um, kind of second tier meeting in that it is a decision-making body and will have virtual, will be supported via virtual access by staff. So it's, it's um, not quite the same level of production, but it's still gonna be where the members of the, of, of the, the authority would be in, in person, but then there would be an ability for um, for remote access to, to participate in the meeting. What, what we presented was kind of a, a, a waterfall method of implementation in that when we do go back, we focus on the legislative bodies first, make sure that, that those are running well, and then we would introduce that next tier. And so I only mean to say that in that I would not anticipate this body being back in person for, for several more months, you know, probably a bit more in towards the, the, the summertime. It's a board of supervisors decision. Uh, we did not give any date certain because we're, you know, we're in the middle of the Omicron surge, but we are planning to go back and have a discussion with the board at the second meeting in February that I think might then allow me to give better information to the authority at, at our next meeting. So Mike, maybe we have an agenda item on that, but I only wanted to raise it because that might also have a, a impact on our dis, uh, discussion around meeting times and dates. It, it, for the next for the th next three meetings, it doesn't sound like it's likely to have any impact at all. But, but no, thank sir. you very much for bringing it up because it will affect us. So I, I'd love to see that on the agenda next time. Um, how does uh, for February, March, and April, the fourth Tuesday look other than Bill with the potential conflict for planning commission meetings? that seem acceptable to folks? Fine on my calendar, sir. I'd hate to lose you, Bill, but I have a feeling that every night of the week is we're gonna tick somebody. And if yours is only potential, then I, that seems like a, a dice we, a die we can roll. Yeah, I, I, yes, um, I, I agree. Okay, well then let me propose that we uh, change our meeting date uh, for February, March, and April to the fourth Tuesday of the month still at five o'clock and that we hold the other dates and times uh, for the rest of the calendar up till the annual meeting the same. Uh, they'll be on the fourth Wednesday. Is there a second to that motion? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Excellent. All right, now I got to remember to update my calendar so I show up. Um, 
if, if I'm not there, the vice chair runs the show. So that's how it goes. Uh, it, we've exhausted our agenda. Is there any other business or comments that we should have at this time? Wow, six o'clock, this is fantastic. The year is off to such a good start. Thank you all very much um, for being with us. And uh, I wish you a, a very good evening. I'll see you next time. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> yes, that, that's fair, fair point. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. I could see by the nodding heads that this was gonna carry unanimously. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Bye folks. Thank you all. Bye -bye.